Uh, <laughs> thank you, Lisa. And uh, I would be kind of remiss if we didn't identify the fact that Tom and Lisa really deserve big thanks for this because, like Lisa said, I walked into her office about two weeks ago and I said, hey, I have this thing, I want to show it. And she said, well, there's these other students, they all did, just asked me the same thing. So Lisa's been bending over backwards to do flyers and stuff like that for us, so we appreciate that. All right, so my independent study um, is mostly in the back. And I'm not actually going to talk about a lot of the things that are back there because what I want to talk about are some of the unexpected discoveries that I made along the way. So it was on the expeditions of the Homo sapiens. And the maps in the back started seven and a half million years ago with the division of the great ape into the gorilla, the chimp, and the homo um, erectus at the time, probably. And so what we're going to talk about today are the four things that I found. This is my favorite one. <laughs> I'm going to connect baseball to the purpose for it being a uh, human. We're going to talk about Norwegian family systems, glaciation, medieval times, and how they're connected to the Northwest Passage, and then a couple concluding thoughts. So, first up, is this is the book that I read, uh, Pathfinders, A Global History of Exploration, by Philippe Fernandez Armesto. And the second book I read, which I actually read before this class with the same professor and instructorship, um, is Barry Lopez's Arctic Dreams. And in uh, Pathfinders, there's an interesting part where he mentions that we have the best adaptable bodies in created throughout time. And the second great advantage that we had um, is this quote here. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. If you want to read it, you're welcome to. But the idea that we had prowess in throwing missiles and that our increased hand and eye coordination was something I did not expect at all to find out through this uh, experience. And so the way I connect that to baseball is the idea that at some point our ancestors looked like this. And I used that exact same hand motion to be able to throw something and kill something in order to feed my family, my tribe, my children, whatever the case is. And when I was about seven or eight years old, this man took Milwaukee Brewers to the World Series. <laughs> this was absolutely my hero for about the next 10 years. And so I was pretty crushed when I realized that uh, natural selection would favor those who could throw the best because I was never a pitcher in baseball. <laughs> so the second nugget my undercover has to do with this guy. Um, Eric the Red is a Norwegian explorer who did a lot of work um, through Iceland. He ended up getting kicked out of Iceland and going to Greenland, setting up the first colony there. And then shortly after 1000, um, I guess CE is the, the current epoch that we want to talk about, Leif Erikson comes along and the king of Norway says they want you to go further into Greenland and uh, Christianize all the, the, the locals there. So in the midst of it, he ends up uh, floating around and gets a little distracted, ends up in the northern coast of Canada, Nova Scotia, he arrives there, there's apparently a plentiful amount of grapes. He calls it Vinland, and this is what we now call Newfoundland. What I didn't know throughout my entire rearing years, um, well, I did know that I was really interested in exploration and what these people are doing. What I didn't know was that this is the father of Eric Sen. So I just found it very odd that you would name the last name of your son, Eric Sun, um, and I had never connected the two until I was 37 years old in college. <laughs> <laughs> I remember playing video games, the Age of Empires, and things like that as a kid, and I played Eric the Red, and, and we went all over Northern Europe as Vikings. <laughs> so the next couple of slides are uh, kind of busy slides, and they're going to get a little more sciencey. So uh, if I go a little too fast, please feel free to ask questions. You don't need to wait till the end to ask any questions. So this is obviously a graph of sea ice off ice and coast. The timeline from your right to left is older to newer. And there are uh, two significant periods of time that we want to cover. The first one is going to be roughly 800 to 1300. And the second, well, let's talk about this one first, actually. That's the first on my arrows. So roughly 1300 to 1900 is a period where we see an increasing amount of sea ice around Iceland. This is significant because previous to this graph in 1200, there was little to no sea ice. So there's probably an issue of... Um, actually reporting the amount of ice, but this period here is actually known as the medieval warm period, and the second one is the little ice age. The reason why I'm bringing these up is because there's a clear difference between the amount of sea ice in the medieval warm period, hence it's called the warm period, versus the little ice age where it's increasing all the way up until this point here. Right at 1900, there's this precipitous fall of sea ice around Iceland, and the other significant period of time is right around 1000 
So keep these two periods of time in mind as we look at the next slides, because they're all going to kind of come together after I show you a few more slides. Another fun, super science-y uh, graph. So all of these are um, glaciers around the world. Um, you got Svalbard, Norway, Indonesia, um, I think there's a couple from Argentina in here. And from your left to right, you see the average length of the glacier. And once again, we have the period of time, roughly, of the Little Ice Age. And the period of time I want to focus on, once again, is 1900, and that's where this line lies. So I just picked four random um, glaciers here to kind of highlight. Each of these is not all that different from the other ones I've not highlighted, but each one of them has a great dip in the glacier length right around the beginning of the Industrial Area, the beginning of the Anthropocene, <coughs> 1850, 1900. And so we can kind of see where I'm going with this. I'm trying not to isolate too many specific areas. It's kind of a global thing as this um, ice age comes to an end. All right, um, next up is the medieval warm period. What I know that you can't read from way back there is that um, these lines in the bottom are what I'm most interested in. So the blue area on the right-hand side is uh, Sweden and Norway. You have Iceland and Maroon in the middle. The Greenland ice cap with the white. And then obviously Northern Canada on the far west, there's Labrador. The reason why I'm going to bring this up, which you cannot read, and I'm going to read them to you, the lines that I kind of highlighted there, early voyages include Eric the Red in 985, who we mentioned already. There are two names on here that I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. One is, occurred in 985 to 986. Leif Erikson landed in Vinland in 1000, and then 1005 is another Norwegian explorer that ends around the same time. My point of bringing this up is to highlight the period of time at 1000 is the center, more or less, of the medieval warm period, and why that's significant is what we'll see in another minute. This is the last science-y graph that I'm going to show you. Um, what this is, is um, a slide I actually stole from Kurt Rupsnyder's climate change class, and all these Colored squiggly lines are proxies identified in usually lake sediment or ice cores taken from around the world. And what they do is they paint a picture of historical temperature. So from left to right, if you can't see it, 900 on the far left of the graph, 1900 is the last marker on the right hand side of the graph. The medieval warm period, the ice age are all marked, and for the sake of climate change class, the 20th century warning, and with our uh, CFCs and our greenhouse gases, it's the last arrow. And what I want to highlight is the same thing we just talked about. The first explorations of Iceland, Greenland, and Nova Scotia seem to occur during the medieval warm period, right around 1000 um, CE. The second period of time, which we mentioned already, is right around 1900. Raoul Amundsen makes the first Northwest Passage successful navigation in 1906. It took him three years to do it. And so what I'm trying to highlight here is the fact that although these explorers should be given complete credit for all the arduous kind of environment they're going through. It seems as if the climate is actually what led up and led these people to making some of these kind of these explorations. So what I wanted to kind of finish with, because my talk is just a short talk, um, the idea that for 400 years, roughly uh, 1500 to 1900, people have been trying to get through the Northwest Passage because they thought it was the best way to not have to go around the Cape of Good Horn. We didn't have Suez Canal back in the day, so they had to find another way to get these silks. 400 years through mutinies and failed attempts. Failed attempts like Shackleton, who spent 21 months locked in sea ice in Antarctica, and brought every single one of his people back to England. Um, mutinies, poor Hudson, the bay that which is named after, was put in a rowboat by his own crew with his son and seven other people, and was set adrift and never heard from again. And so for 400 years, people struggled through this. And this is a little depiction of what I end up finding. So risking, risking this view for many cold, dark months, these ships were locked in an ice like this. They waited months or even years to find a lead that finally opened up before they got a little bit of a better view like this. The earth opens up for them, and then it winds up happening as all the restrictions of Mother Nature seems to exist. And this is the last thought that I want to leave you with for the day. And I'll read it for those in the back. I have an incredible amount of respect for the men that accomplished so much in trying to find their way through the Northwest Passage. But it seems that there was, it was Mother Nature who was the gatekeeper and allowed for homo sapiens, daring enough to venture into it and back out. We often think of the great minds of our species and our technological advances. 
but perhaps the accomplishment of the great expeditionary men and women of the past is most evident, or at least partially due, to what the earth will permit us to do. And that is the end. Um, my thanks go out to Lee James for mentoring the project and giving me plenty of rope to climb or hang myself with. <laughs> um, the eight people featured on the blue panel on my uh, thing in the back is uh, our Prescott College community members that have accomplished really great expeditions back there. Um, some actual first ascents of mountains, um, first descents on skis of mountains, things like that. And then, uh, like I said, the Natural History Institute for having us here today. So that's all I have. If anyone has any questions, I'll take them. Yeah, I do. Sure. Um, some of those ships that got stuck, did they have prior knowledge of other ships that got stuck so they were very prepared, so they knew they'd probably get stuck? I would imagine and so. And they brought enough supplies? I would imagine so, because I was really shocked at Shackleton's documentary, for example, and how long the men were reporting yeah. that um, things like they dropped their tobacco in the water, something like a year and a half after they had gone landlocked. So they obviously had enough yeah. materials to have the luxury like tobacco handy. Yeah. And then as far as the ships go, I can't imagine they wouldn't have that kind of knowledge. Um, just for example, um, number nine on one of my maps in the back is to do with, I believe, a guy named Harry, who uh, mapped Bolivia and part of the rainforest. And after he went missing, uh, over 100 people died in the subsequent journeys to try to find him. So I can't imagine the same not being true for the seagoing folks. Anybody else? Awesome. Uh, we can do We were initially going to do a quick transition. We're going to switch an SD card, I think, on the camera. So it's just going to be sit tight for maybe 90 seconds, two minutes, and then uh, Isla will come up and talk. Actually, we're done. Oh, you're done? Oh, okay, excellent. Well, Isla is next. She's going to talk about uh, her independence.